everybody. All right, <clears throat> let's start. Um, I'd like to get grounded and centered just because it's been a process to get on and it's nice just to make sure that I'm in a skillful mind state before I um, try to pass it on. So let's take a deep breath in. And a slow breath out. And bringing awareness to the body. Feeling the body. Feeling the breath. Feeling the moment. Coming to rest in harmony with the moment. Let's take a breath in and a breath out. We'll bring our palms together and feel the example of the hands. And we'll bring that example into the body, into the breath, into the mind. Feeling the power of example. And so we've come together to do some work and to put forth an effort and to allow that effort to be supported by those around us. And we'll make a beginning by dedicating the benefit of that effort to all beings. May all beings be safe. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be happy. May all beings know peace. May they know freedom and may they move to the world with ease. Namaste. All righty. Um, so uh, I am, um, my name is Rolf Gates and I'm a friend of Tommy Rosen. And so when Recovery 2.0 reached out and asked me to do this, it's you know, not just the hand of you know, AA that reached out to me, but the hand of a dear friend. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. And I called up Nikki Myers, who I think has already talked this month, and I asked her like what the format is and stuff. And so it sounds like I have about 25 minutes right now to talk, and then I'll take questions from the chat. And that's the that's the process. So here we go. I'm gonna go with traditional 12 step. Um, what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, what it was like was, um, you know, um, I guess I was kind of um, ordinary. Um, I had, I was dropped off in an orphanage when my mom, when I was 10 days old and I spent my first years in an orphanage and then I was adopted into a, into kind of a challenged household. There was like violence and yelling and a lot of suffering in the household, more suffering that I could process. So I kind of grew up just managing my inner life poorly, mostly watching television. Um, and then just not feeling adequate to the task of like paying attention in school or, you know, I guess even forming, you know, relationships. Um, so I was more just living on television and I, I found a way to kind of get by on television. And then the training of sports really was quite something for me. I loved, I would just, a kid who would go out and hit a, you know, use a hockey. We had, I was in Boston, so we played hockey. And so I would just shoot shots on net for in street hockey style for an afternoon or throw a ball against a, a wall with a, a lacrosse stick. You know, I was playing very kind of New england -y sports. And um, um, so sports really did it for me. The moment I started um, lifting weights, that did it for me. And so 
I kind of lived somewhere between athletic discipline and completely numbing out on television. So by the time I started using it at 14, I was ready to go. I, I, I had found ways to just to manage my inner life as opposed to like grow through it, uh, process it and grow through it. It was more, it was like, it was like taking aspirin for life or Advil for life as opposed to learning about life. Um, I learned about television. I learned about sports, but I didn't really learn about anything else. And so drugs and alcohol were enormously impactful. Um, my friends were all kids like me and they were all using before I did. I was like the last to pick up in my family and my friend group. So it would later be like um, annoying that all my friends and family were like, well, you had a problem. I was like the last person to pick up. You guys all like went for it years before I did. And I finally just gave in. And now I had the problem. Um, uh so, um, yeah, so I picked up at 14. I was a blackout drinker, um, kind of, you know, got kicked out of uh, school in, let me see, ninth grade, kicked out of school my junior year. So I was kicked out of two schools. And as a result of being kicked out of two schools, I went to four schools um, because of drugs and alcohol. I mean, there's no other explanation it wasn't i'm watching my son who's a lot like me uh without the trauma and the confusion um he just didn't like school but like not liking school isn't that hard you can still get through school so i'm watching him get through school with like a's even though he doesn't like it the way i didn't like it he doesn't like it but i couldn't handle not liking it like he's just like okay don't treat the impermanent like it's permanent and just move on and like don't attract a lot of negative attention just kind of deal with your stuff and move on he realizes that academics aren't his dharma but he's like why should i attract negative attention and limit my options in school i'm just gonna like put up with this for a few more years and that's his attitude and i couldn't i couldn't pull that off i just had to medicate and make a lot of drama and get into a lot of trouble um so what it was like is that i i used and it got worse and um i had all all the usual in boston they call them jackpots you know i had all the usual jackpots I had the, um, the demoralization that Bill W. talks about, and I had the mental decline, I think, that's talked about often. Um, so that by, I remember like my last two years of drinking, I got sober at 26. Um, I was in the army. Um, I tried to find discipline. I realized at some point that I needed structure. So I, I, went, into, I, I went into the military and um, the military offered structure, but that wasn't a cure for what, what ailed me. Um, so I'm in the military in Germany and I just remember like my last year or so having um, brain damage. So like I, I couldn't remember if I went from one room to another, I couldn't remember what had happened in that room. So like finding things became this dogged process of just circling my apartment because I couldn't like reflect like where was I like three minutes ago and what was I doing? I couldn't remember what I was doing three minutes ago. A complete blackout, like, you know, the blackouts you have when you're using, I was having them waking. Like if I went from one room to the next, I had a blackout about like what I'd done. This is while I was a military officer stationed in Germany um, with a tremendous amount of responsibility. I'd somehow managed to find myself in a situation that was like, um, yeah, we were the entire, I was there for three years and the entire time uh, my unit was on like a two hour alert, meaning no matter what was happening, we needed to be like in our vehicles ready to fight within two hours. And that was never not the case for three years. For three years, I was under that kind of pressure. And I was like blacking out everywhere. You know, I was like blacking out. Every time I drank, I would black out. So I would like commonly, I would wake up. Um, I'd wake up on a Sunday or Saturday morning and not know if it was Saturday or Sunday um, at all. Like, which was like big because it's like, oh my God, I have to go to work on Monday, but I don't know if it's a Saturday, it's a Sunday. I have no idea. And I was in Germany, so I couldn't really read the newspapers and figure out, I feel like this is before internet. So I have like, I was just like, I just lived for hours on end on a weekend, be not really knowing if it was Saturday or Sunday. And like, and that, and the only relevance of that was like, can I like buy like two cases of German beer and get seriously shit faced again? Or do I have to prepare for work the next day? Because I'm feeling very sick and weird. Um, so that was my, that's what it was like. Um, what happened was that the disease progressed to the point that those around me couldn't really turn a blind eye. And 
um, there was various forms of intervention, military style, and I ended up talking to a therapist and a counselor. And um, eventually I was introduced to someone who was a member of AA. And this person brought me to a meeting and I got the big book and um, I drank for two more weeks. And at some point I opened up the big book and I read and I, and I heard about, I kind of saw myself in it. And um, 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 there can be no, um, amount of clarity I can bring to how much I didn't know that I was an addict and how much reading the big book meant that I knew that I was an addict. It went from not knowing to knowing in like three pages. And then what they said in the, the doctor's opinion is that people sought spiritual aid and that and I, what I determined was through prayer. Um, so on May 21st, 1990, I prayed. Um, and I asked for help. And I received help and I, and I'm that one of those people for whom the desire to drink was lifted. So on May 21st, 1990, the desire was lifted and it's hard to kind of, I want to empathize with people who are like newer and like, like, dude, can this, can you refine this story in a way that like I can grasp? It's like, yeah, I was just like you and I had no idea how I was ever going to survive my addiction. I read three pages of the big book and it kind of described my experience. I had never had someone explain my experience to me. I literally felt like a solo act. Like I was having, I was the only addict on the planet. I was the only one having this experience. And when I read the big book, it was like, oh, I have alcoholism. <laughs> and it was that simple for me. It was like, oh, I have alcoholism. And these guys pray. And so I tried prayer and the God lifted the addiction from me in that moment. And I'd like to be more useful <laughs> to say like, what was the process? It's like, well, I, I woke up like a full-blown alcoholic dying of my addiction in ignorance. I read about three pages of the big book, identified myself and I became willing to pray. Now I'm sure that there was a lot of things that supported me. Like I went, I was on good sports teams. I had good coaches. I went to good schools. I had good teachers. I was in the military, I had good leaders. And so they had all kind of taught me some sort of willingness to behave well, some sort of willingness to learn. Um, but it still feels to me to be a very cockamamie story. It's like, so you were a full-blown addict. You read three pages of the big book. You were determined that you should pray. You prayed once and the desire was lifted. And I'm like, yes, that's what happened. You said, what happened? And well, that's what happened. About two days later, uh, a friend of mine mentioned that his uncle was sober in Arizona for 20 years and he still went to meetings and suggested that I go to a meeting. And I was like, screw you. I'm, I'm like, fine. I have this blue book and I'm, you know, God made me sober. But that night, um, it's weird, but I was watching a television show so bad. I was like, it just started at seven o'clock and the meeting started at seven and the meeting was on my military. I was on a military base. And so I could just walk to the meeting and I'm like watching this show and it was so freaking bad. And I'm just like, do I watch this terrible television show or do I walk across this field and go to this meeting? And eventually I just walked to the meeting, um, which is like, this probably, that, that decision probably saved my life. And I met my sponsor and my sponsor, Henry, um, was there for me for the next like six months, I like had six months left in the military. And for those six months, he was there for me. And it was not a small matter what he did for, for me. Um, um, I was with him going to meetings for 10 days and then I went to rehab. Um, and in those 10 days, like his kind of, kind of attitudinal training made me um, open and available to my rehab. I didn't go to rehab like, oh, I'm an addict or whatever. It's like with, with the meetings and with Henry, I was just like, I know what my mission is. I'm going to go to rehab and do the best I can to, to learn, you know, um, and be a good sober doobie. And I got my, my 30 day chip and my 60 day chip in rehab, uh, came out like, right, you know, guns blazing. And, uh, right about the time I got my 30, my, not my three month ship, which was huge. The day I got my three month ship, my sponsor got his uh, six year medallion. And it was like, I was like, 
becoming part of the club, you know, like my counselors were all friends of Henry. And so they went to the meeting to see Henry get his six year medallion. Like there's like probably 30, you know, Americans getting sober in Germany and Frankfurt, Germany at the time. So everyone knew each other. And so the guy at 12 set me, um, took me to my first meeting. He was there. My counselors were there. Henry was there. And then Henry gets his six year medallion and like tells the story. And I like get my three month chip. And it's just like, you know, I am like an established silver person. Um, like probably the next day, it's like, we're going to war. Like the year I got sober, we went to the first, uh, the per first Persian Gulf war. And so stuff is getting extremely real. Uh, I was three months sober and my unit was going to war and I was no longer just this adult person. I was like becoming a 26 year old who had to kind of wake up and make choices and get real with himself about like who he wanted to be in the world, you know? And I tried different things, you know, I went to like, like a religious retreat and, um, you know, uh, I did, I started working the steps with Henry and, um, and sure enough, right about the time I was, you know, about to like get on a boat and go over to the Persian Gulf, my paperwork came through and I got on a plane and went home. It was like this, you know, everyone else I knew, everyone I knew, everyone I got sober with went to the Persian Gulf and I went to the United States. Um, my, my ETS, my, my, my time in the military ended four days before they do, when wars start, they just don't, don't let people out of the military. This thing called stop loss and stop loss happened four days before, four days after. So I was in my sister's um, kitchen reading the paper about stop loss. Like four days after I got out of the army. Um, so I, I missed the war. Um, between my six month medallion and my or ship and my nine month ship, my, my sister died of an overdose, overdose. I was living in her house and um, um, things had gotten real when we were deploying to go to combat and things got way realer when I was listening to the ambulances come from my sister who was already dead. Um, and I had to dig deep, you know, I had to decide like, you know, who I was going to be, you know, what I was going to live for. And I can't say that um, her death didn't change me as a person, like kind of permanently. I became um, very committed to um, not just the path of recovery, but the community of recovery. I, I had no interest in doing anything else. I wanted to be an, I, I got trained as an addictions counselor. Um, I worked in, I worked with adolescents in residential treatment. And I just was just like, okay, I'm done with all the bullshit. I'm just gonna be a sober person, um, helping people be sober in the world. And this is what I'm gonna do. And this is, uh, I had a mentor who was a social worker. Um, and, um, and he was kind of guiding me through like, okay, get your certificate in addictions counseling get some years under your belt treating these kids and then apply to graduate school, go to graduate school, get your social work degree. So he had this whole path for me as a sober man living in the Boston area. Um, and he was one of the guys who, who founded the early um, um, halfway houses, right? Um, um, before there was kind of degrees or anything like sober men, we're just starting founding these sober houses where people could come and, and get six months under their belt or whatever. And so he was one of those people and eventually he got a degree and, but he was like a, like a senior kind of addictions treatment provider in the Boston area. Um, and uh, like his work preceded like certifications and degrees. Like he was like old school, op got sober, opened a house, opened a couple houses, did the work for a long time and eventually got a degree. And so this guy had my respect, you know, and he said, this is how you do it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it his way. Um, but sure enough, working in the industry, working with recovering people is working with traumatized people. And I was, a, I'm a deeply traumatized human, like I'm recovering traumatized human. And so uh, I found it very difficult to be in the presence of trauma. And this is where yoga and meditation came into my life. Um, it started with meditation. Uh, I started 
meditating, just write, reading some books and meditating because it's the 11th step. And I was a good doobie. And so I was doing everything in the 12 steps. And one of them was like, learn to meditate. And so I, was, I started meditating in 1991. And, uh, um, and meditation helped, but there was something missing. And when I heard about yoga poses, I'm like, that's kind of, that sounds great. And sure enough, I went to Kripalo um, about five years sober and started doing yoga poses. And so this traumatized addict doing yoga poses was flipping awesome. It was just what was missing. There was just so much pain in my body, so much emotional pain in my body that I couldn't process. And, you know, I was a terrified child and I was, uh, I was a, fully hated person of color like a you know growing up a person of color in the united states you're like hated i don't you know I, I we have all these different terms for for what we're talking about but you're like freaking hated you are a hated and despised human being and so i had like the the pain of a child growing up around violence but i also had a, the pain of a child recognizing that his society despises him like just desp outright despises him and, 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 is, and does not include him. My wife and I watched a movie that we really enjoyed. We think is fantastic. It's called Meet Joe Black. And it was made the year we got married. We got married in 98. It's like an all white cast, you know? It's like, it's as recent as 1998. It's like fantastic acting, fantastic writing. Everything is great. I recommend it, you know? But like, it's like an all white cast. Like all white, there's like not a person of color to be found in this entire, it's a three hour movie. In 1998, I was 34 years old and that was the world I lived in. I was, it was like utter rejection. And you can't sugarcoat that shit. <laughs> this is utter rejection. You're not included in this three hour movie. You don't get represented here. And I understand there's a number of other groups who can say me too, right? But like that was in my body. It wasn't just that I was a despised, you know, and, and, and abused child. I was a despised entity in the world. And then you saw in my own self-loathing from being an addict. And like my inner life was difficult. And uh, I got out on my yoga mat and I found a way to let it go. And so I had to dive into yoga. I did probably like 10 years of doing yoga poses, teaching yoga poses before I kind of circled back and dove into meditation. I want to um, give you guys like five minutes of my professional opinion now, because I've been a yoga teacher for like 25 years. And I've been, um, you know, I'm now like a certified, I'm a meditation teacher. I work, at, I work on the faculty for Spirit Rock Meditation Society. So I'm kind of accredited in yoga and meditation. So I thought I'd give you like five minutes of my professional opinion about the, where yoga and meditation meet with um, addictions recovery. I think that the addict needs to learn how to not drink or not use. And I don't think that, you, I just don't think that um, when you talk to people, who I have talked recently to people who are like on a fence and they're slipping and sliding they're going to really push back on this whole like getting sober thing. Like, is it really necessary? And my unvarnished opinion is absolutely <laughs> like 100%. No, you got to get sober. It's not like a, you know, only on weekends kind of thing. And so there's, this is my opinion. There's, there's a place in the arc of recovery where you just focus on putting days together and you become that person for whom staying sober is your number one priority. Without that, the rest of this won't work at all. 31 years sober, this is my experience. Is that without physical sobriety, the rest of the stuff won't work. And so there's a place, and this is why I think Recovery 2.0 is on point, is that Tommy doesn't flinch around the, the role of 12 steps in, uh, in someone's recovery. It's critical that we be a part of a community where staying sober one day at a time matters a lot. Um, um, number two is, um, once that's going on, then you got to deal with the reality. You know, they say the underlying causes, cause uh, maybe they didn't have the term, maybe they were just being nice, but the reality is, is that 
you know, in some cases, there's, there's actual mental illness that we have to deal with. And a friend of mine's working through a bipolar illness right now in early recovery. Um, but for most of us, it's just like we have like a lot of trauma and the trauma is messed with us at every level. And we have to learn how to treat trauma. And there's a way that like no one treats trauma for you. You have to treat it for yourself. And this is why um, yoga and meditation are such powerful tools because by definition, the teacher says do this or that, but you're the one who guides themselves into the experience. Yoga and meditation are self-guided. In my translation of the Yoga Sutras, the first teaching of yoga is, and now I begin to guide myself. I feel as though the traumatized person has to guide themselves out of that state. They have to take responsibility for it. And they didn't, they can't, they didn't like cause it, but they have to guide themselves out of it. And in, in my opinion, um, yoga and meditation kind of systematically guide you out of the state of that kind of um, contracted state of trauma into it, into increasingly sophisticated states of connection. And that this is actually being, um, um, I wouldn't say proven, but, but, but like codified, uh, identified, like you measurably thicken this part of the brain and that part of the brain. And then the, the prefrontal cortex starts to, to communicate more effectively to the limbic system. You become more in emotionally intelligent. Um, I think that um, I want to I want to close with this. There's a book that I use in my trainings called The Buddha's Brain that speaks to this recovery process through yoga and meditation for someone in addiction recovery. It's from the forward. And it's by a guy named Daniel Siegel, and he says that the the mind can change the brain, right? So the problem with trauma is it's, it's changed our brain and we can change it back or change it forward with the use of the mind. So the mind can change the brain, right? That we can change the activity and the structure of the brain. The key is to know the steps towards using awareness to promote well-being. The key is to know the steps towards using awareness to promote well-being. This is what yoga and meditation are offering us, is a way to change the activity and the structure of the brain by knowing the steps towards using awareness to promote well-being. If you want to know what Buddhism is, you want to know what yoga is, it's the steps towards using awareness to promote well-being and thereby changing the activity and the structure of your brain. And that's going to be, I think, you know, our best shot at that level of recovery, right? There's gonna be levels of recovery that we encounter and the healing of the brain through the practice of yoga and meditation to me are, are kind of our best shot at long-term um, happiness and effectiveness in life. Okay, I'm done. Um, that was my talk. Uh, I think what I do now is I look at, um, yeah, chapter five of Buddha's Brain talks about recruiting the parasympathetic nervous system. Really big deal for us recovering folks. Um, let's see, is there any part of that resents or did resent having to be sober or live a sober lifestyle? Any part that feels trapped by that has to be lived a certain way? Um, no, I, I, I'm not one of those people. I don't, I don't have, I, I didn't, I freaking love being sober. I loved my recovering community. I, I, I had zero resentment. I, I just had, I was defeated by my, my active, my active addiction left me defeated and recovery left me with a path forward. So I understand that people, I, I understand that people <laughs> like there's a way that if you're in a contracted state, you, you don't know that you're in a contracted state. So a contracted state would be like, you're angry and you see a world that justifies your anger or you're sad and you see a world that justifies your sadness, or you're clinging to your substance and you're seeing a world that justifies clinging to your substance. I had the benefit of having my higher power relieve me of my clinging to my substance. So I was just in the aftermath of that weird experience being like, what do I do now? And then the recovering people showed up and said, hey, why don't you try this? I'm like, sure. Um, so there isn't, I, 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 
I honestly feel also that like using is BS, right? It's like life is hard enough. We need to give our level best to everything we do. And drugs and alcohol are just not going to support that effort. And so there's nothing is being left on the table by not using one day at a time. Like life is life demands all that we have, and using is a major mistake in that relationship. Um, that's my feeling about the whole um, resentment thing. Uh, hello, community. Good to hear from you. Uh, let's see. Thank you. Could you talk about the hands and prayer example you mentioned in the beginning? That was the first time I heard that. Oh, cool. Um, and thank you, Bev. Um, and what are some daily routines? Okay. So I'll answer uh, Jan's question and then uh, what are some daily routines? Um, so what I'm doing here is this is a mudra. And what I find is that the way our attention works is that we put our attention here and the body goes slack, right? Or we start listening to the birds outside and the body goes slack. But we just start looking at our, our thinking and the, the body goes slack. And so if you put your attention here, you're like all your attention is in your hands and your hands are like, like this is a practice mudra. So if you think about it, my hands are like, wah, wah. so they're like awake and they're calm and they're like connected, but I'm not bringing any awareness to the rest of my body. And one of the things that I want to teach you in yoga is the power of, you know, remember the key is to know how to use awareness to promote well-being. So we brought awareness into uh, our hands and then we can bring awareness into the body and not just awareness, but intention. So what's happened with this is we've learned this combination of awareness and intention to create this gesture. And so this gesture is this kind of DNA of awareness and, 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 and intention. And then we can take that awareness and intention and bring that awareness and intention to, into the body. I'm like, wow, I have the power of awareness and intention. Yeah, and now you can bring that awareness and intention to your breath. Wow, I can do that. That, so we're going from like something not so subtle to something more subtle, to, from the body to the breath. Oh, so it's, it works with the body, but it also works with something subtle like the breath. And it works with something even more subtle like the mind. And it works like that. This is what you're learning in yoga pose. It's like, you could be like, I'm in a yoga pose. And then like, I'm like, hey, change your mind. Oh, how long does it take me to change my mind? Hey, change your attitude, change your effort. You're like, wow, I have a lot more agency than I thought I had. I, I can like take what I'm doing with my hands and I can bring it into my body. I can bring it into my breath. I can bring it into my mind. We are learning the role that we play in our own lives. And no one really, like I started way, if agency is here, by the time I was five, I was like lying my back over there. And addiction didn't help with that. And what recovery was doing is slowly bringing me into the actual capacity that I have to affect my own experience. And so it's like, you can affect the experience of your body. Huh. You can affect your experience of your breath. Huh. You can even affect the experience of your mind. Huh. You got a lot of choice in life. You don't have to live from the outside in. You can live from the inside out. And so that's like, you know, the underlying premise of that kind of practice. Also, I just like the idea of the hands being an example that the rest of us can follow. This idea of having examples that we can follow and the ease with which we can follow an example. Final question, I think. I think we're pretty much... Daily routines. Um, I think that the best advice I was given was to block off a couple hours a day that are for you. It seems like a lot, but um, I just, just, you know, you can be like, oh, I have 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah, 20 minutes for yourself. Cool. But um, I had a mentor who said that he used kind of like, he, I won't get into what, how, where he put his time, but he had this time, you know, every day um, that he used um, and I think it was three hours um, that he used for himself. And he was a single guy, you know, um, who was running his own. He was running a meditation center. So he didn't, he, it was like, he could set his own hours. I'm a dad, I got a couple, I got kids, just that and the other. Um, but I found that from 10 to 12 every day, I could like 
set aside from myself. I have to like, I can't like wake up and meditate and do this. I have to like wake up and make breakfast for my, uh, my son and interact with my wife who's going to work for a long, hard day. And so that's how I start my day. And then, I'm, I, then I start work. But around 10 o'clock from 10 to 10 to 12, is just my time. And what I like about just having that be your commitment is it doesn't be 10 to 12, obviously, but but having a time that's your practice time is that you can then fill it up with whatever you want. What's interesting is it's, it's not, I used to think of, well, I've got to like do commit to the meditation or I got to commit to asana or I got to commit to surfing or CrossFit or whatever. I have to commit to getting to my meetings, I have to commit to this side or the other. It's really, I have to commit to like from 10 to 12 every day, I'm going to use it for my well being to promote well being. And then I'm going to put into that 10 to 12 slot what seems like the most beneficial if it's hiking with my dog outside, you know, if it's surfing with my friends, if it's doing a yoga meditation period, it's like trusting that you will, you know, use your, your practice window properly and not worry about the content of your window. It's just get your window going and keep it there and, and just have it be a part of every day of your life. Every day of your life, there's this time that's blocked off and you're going to use it, um, you know, perfectly. You got to just know like, yeah, what would really be the most best use of my time today is this. And so I'm going to like move some ducks around and like do use my window of my, my well-being window thusly. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't have like your well-being. Me, to me, well-being, the well-being window is not like separate from a meeting window, right? But it can all, but it's also, to, it's that time for me is more about exercise, time in nature time on my mat, time on my cushion. Time in a meeting is something that, the advantage of a meeting is you don't have to put any energy into it. During my practice window, I'm generating the energy. I'm choosing what I'm doing. I'm committing to it. I'm following through, I'm making it happen. I'm generating, I'm putting energy into something. The beauty of a meeting is you can kind of show up and eat a burrito while you're listening to people talk right? Meetings are awesome that way. You don't have to generate any energy. You can just like turn on a screen and like watch and get something out of it. So I wouldn't put meetings on the same plane as that practice window because the practice meeting window is time where you put energy into something to get something out of it. Let's take a deep breath in and a slow breath out and bring our palms together and feel the attitude of the hands. And bring that attitude into the body. The breath. The mind. Feeling into the power of example. And we'll close by offering the benefit of our efforts to all beings. May all beings be safe. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be happy. May all beings know peace. May they know freedom. And may they move the world with ease. Namaste. Thank you, Recovery 2.0, for having me. Thank you, Recovery 2.0 community, for being here. Um, it was an honor, and I, I know I'll see you guys soon. Take care.